Okay, so um, I think we'll start. Um, so thank you all for coming. Um, our speaker today is Professor Ella Ransman, and she's going to, um, well, as many of you know, she's a research um, professor here in the Department of Epidemiology, and she's um, also director of research at the National Suicide Prevention Foundation. So um, I'll just give it a few seconds for a few more people to Oh, yeah. I'll turn it up, is that? Yeah. So um, the talk will be just be for 40 minutes and we'll have plenty of time for uh, questions afterwards. So with that, I'll just welcome Ella. So yeah. you can take it over. Thank you very much, uh, Fiona. And a uh, special thanks to Fiona and Patricia for organizing these very important uh, seminars. Also a special thank you to Caroline Daly and Niall McTurnan because particularly this week I think I have lectures every day so without Caroline and Niall I wouldn't make it in time. And also uh, Caroline and Niall have taken care of copies of slides and also an informative leaflet on World Suicide uh, Prevention Day. I'm delighted to see so many people uh, here and uh, there's no doubt about I think the importance of the topic and I would say in Ireland particularly also in light of the new national uh, strategy for suicide prevention uh, which I re will refer to as well. World Suicide Prevention Day 2016, 10th of September. Today is the 21st of, of September. Am I delayed? <laughs> no, I'm not delayed because uh, there's a number of reasons why we plan the lecture today. First of all, um, I was involved in the global launch of World Suicide Prevention Day on the 10th of September in uh, Oviedo in Spain. That was in conjunction with the European uh, Conference. And then we had hoped to do it last week here in the department, but about half of the department was at the conference in York, <laughs> so we kept catching up. And to, in fairness, World Suicide Prevention Day is in existence now uh, 13 years, and in many countries the day has evolved in a week, and in some countries there's the whole month of September there are important events in this uh, area. So during this uh, lecture, I would like to give you a few ins and outs of the importance and the growth of World Suicide Prevention Day internationally, uh, some updates on suicide prevention globally, uh, and I would like to spend some time on important components of national suicide prevention programs, but particularly to highlight the growing evidence base for these uh, components and to link it back to how can we benefit from the, this in the Irish context and particularly in terms of the uh, components or the objectives of the Irish National Strategy for Suicide Prevention. So here you get an impression of activities of World Suicide Prevention Day 2015. And when you look at even that uh, lower bullet point there, that in 2015, in the two months, August and September, we had 7 million hits on the YASP uh, website. And that's particularly a peak during the year when researchers, clinicians, volunteers, policymakers would like to obtain information to organize uh, events. So over the years we've seen a significant increase of countries being involved, activities being organized, and particularly in some countries where there's very limited government uh, support, the, uh, what I call the bottom-up approach from communities, from services, but also from researchers, to make a strong case for suicide prevention nat nationally. And I will give you later on a few examples of countries where, first of all, we wouldn't have expected to see developments in a national suicide prevention program, where, but where World Suicide Pre Prevention Day was really the instigator of building a national suicide prevention uh, program. I'm currently also chairing the International Association for Suicide Prevention, and 2014 was an important year because in that year, YASP worked very closely together with the WHO to publish, to prepare the first global report on suicide prevention. And I will come back to you in, in that in a, in a minute. So in terms of the context of progressing internationally in terms of suicide prevention, I think a key pillar has been, or key driver has been, the launch of the Global Mental Health Action Plan in 2013. And interestingly, all health ministers of all 196 uh, WHO member states signed up for this plan. 
even countries where currently suicide is still considered a criminal act. So it's, it's a positive that health ministers sign up, but we have to be vigilant and see what actually is going to happen in these countries. So the global report was another important uh, stimulus, and I think that probably couldn't have happened without the Global Mental Health Action Plan. Uh, and particularly in the last two years since uh, the launch of the global uh, report, we've in, in YASP we've seen a significant increase in countries starting or completing the first national suicide prevention program or countries moving into their second national suicide prevention program. And examples in this are Ireland, uh, Scotland, but also the uh, US. And obviously then uh, partners who started working very closely together around the time of the global report uh, are also still collaborating on gathering and building the international evidence uh, base. So the commitment of the health ministers is very uh, important and in most of the countries we will see initiatives in national suicide prevention program being led, being driven by health ministers, but health is only one component and you will see that during this uh, presentation that we need so many other stakeholders as well in education, in agriculture, in justice. So uh, the global report very much supports a cross-sectoral approach towards the implementation of suicide uh, prevention activities. So there has been uh, an agreement on uh, specified actions and, and, and global uh, goals, and particularly driven by the global report, and some very optimistic uh, targets in terms of um, trying to achieve a 20% increase in service coverage for severe mental disorders by 2020. And again, if we take into account countries where suicide is currently still criminalized, how is that going to work out? So, but WHO is very keen to keep the ball rolling and to keep monitoring the uh, progress, and YASP, of course, as well. 10% reduction of the suicide rate in countries by 2020, another optimistic target, So, and this is also obtained by many countries in their national suicide prevention program. You may wonder why in Ireland we m were more reluctant, and the main explanation is that we still have to move uh, ahead in terms of improving the accuracy of our suicide mortality data, which in fact is one of the key objectives of the new National Suicide Prevention Program. So if you have that target, but if at the same time you have to improve the accuracy, can you use uh, your, your evidence base to measure the effectiveness of the activities by 2020? And that these challenges are particularly associated with challenges in the coronial uh, system. So here I would like to show you, first of all, the coverage of the ISP WHO Global Survey on Suicide and Suicide Prevention. We conducted this survey um, in 2013. And the survey was sent mainly to ISP members in 157 countries. But for an email survey, the response rate was quite promising. It was quite high. And we were particularly uh, impressed by uh, the engagement of the Eastern Mediterranean region. So for the first time ever, we got insight into uh, issues around suicide, suicide prevention, from Eastern Mediterranean countries. And the 18 African countries was an achievement as well, because we don't know much about the happenings, and particularly not about the government support in these areas. So globally, where are we in terms of government support and development of national suicide prevention programs? So it is encouraging to see that in two thirds of the countries, suicide is viewed by the government as a significant public health problem, but we still have more than one third where this needs to be uh, emphasized. emphasized. And here we're talking particularly about the countries where suicide is still considered a criminal act. And then uh, in terms of the implementation of suicide prevention uh, programs, 21% has a fully implemented strategy, and in some of those countries, uh, people are, the governments are moving on with the second strategy. In 54% um, of the countries, uh, the implementation is still ongoing, and we also had um, a quarter that indicated uh, no response, or we don't, where we don't have any specific information. 
So what are important challenges in developing and implementing national suicide prevention programs? As I said, we're still dealing with a considerable number of countries where suicide is considered a criminal act. And it may be hard for you to understand, but these are the countries where people who engage in non-fatal self-harm or attempted suicide can still end up in prison rather than in a mental health service. And until about three years ago, we received uh, cases and information from countries such as uh, Guyana um, and Afghanistan. But interestingly, uh, the government in Guyana in South America has moved up and has now a national suicide prevention program. So I come back to that later. There's particular challenges across the world when you look at challenges in how to restrict access to highly lethal methods of attempted suicide and suicide, particularly self-poisoning with pesticides, because in many rural areas there's very easy access to pesticides, but also self-immolation. And with the information that we obtained from the countries in the EMRO region, we discovered that in those countries, suicide is generally higher amongst women compared to men, and it's very much due, due by the method of self-immolation. Other hindering or blocking factors are ineffective planning, coordination, uh, collaboration, also lack of enforcement of guidelines, and I'm aware we have also people of the media here today, but later on I would like to give some positive and some negative feedback on the media, because in Ireland we have for at least six years, media guidelines of the reporting of suicide. And even if we look back at the examples of the last couple of weeks, then I, sometimes we wonder, have we ever had these guidelines or, or when they, were they ever la launched or uh, endorsed? So there's still a lot of work to be done. Insufficient resources. In terms of the global work I'm involved in, I think too often the excuses being given by policy makers is that the government doesn't provide enough funding eh, for suicide prevention activities. Funding is important, but it's not the only issue. I've been dealing with people in health services where stigma was the main blocking factor. And often I, I indicated that even if we had loads amounts of funding, if we can't tackle the stigma, we may not be able to put in place sustainable interventions. And then there's always, in, in, and I'm expecting already questions from you in terms of what works, what doesn't work. And Globally, overall, we still, most of the time, uh, don't know exactly. However, uh, particularly this year and last year, some very high quality systematic reviews have come out, and I will allude to that, uh, with some very promising and robust evidence in terms of certain intervention and prevention areas. And in this area, as in probably many other areas, if you think you're on top of something, then other challenges uh, uh, arise. And I think I just would like to highlight that even in Europe, there are still many countries that don't have a national suicide prevention program or where the ball is just uh, rolling. And But then there's also countries where in the last two years we've seen a huge increase of refugees, migrants, and particularly uh, this is a generation of refugees and migrants who bring a lot of adversity uh, with them because coming from Syria, coming from Pakistan or um, Afghanistan, there is a lot of trauma already uh, within the countries and obviously when people uh, cross the borders, cross countries, there are many losses as well. So uh, this year, earlier this year, I was involved in leading a Horizon 2020 application with particular focus on the new groups of migrants and refugees and to look particularly at the comorbidity of post-traumatic stress disorder, depression and suicidal behavior because that's a huge issue amongst uh, these groups and obviously the challenges in terms of language and culture. However, there's reason to keep going, to be optimistic, because despite all these challenges, we currently, and I'm going to say currently in the last two years, have seen some amazing examples of uh, government support and new initiatives in countries like Lithuania, Guyana, uh, Suriname, uh, Bhutan, Mongolia, and also Afghanistan. And I think it's worth 
to mention that uh, Lithuania is the country in Europe with the highest suicide rate for many years, but also the highest homicide rate. So there is a certain relatedness between deprivation, fragmentation, linked in with homicide, but also suicide. So, so obviously the challenges in those countries are very high. And Guyana, Guyana is the country with the highest rate of suicide in the world. But last December, I received from the government in Guyana the first five-year national suicide prevention program. And I couldn't believe it, because when the global report from WHO was launched, I was hoping that those countries would come along, but I never had expected that a year from the launch of the global report, they already had the plan in order. So obviously I can't go into depth in too many examples, but just in terms of uh, Guyana then. So overall they have uh, the highest rate of suicide uh, per 100,000 in the world. But for men, the, the figure is still astronomers, it's around 70 per 100 thousand and that is particularly instigated again by access to pesticides guns as, as, as well and um, pesticides particularly in rural areas and that doesn't only account for suicide but also for attempted suicide uh, Guyana is one of the few countries in South America with very long-term and rigorous criminal criminalization of suicide and attempted suicide and I do believe that the fact that the mental health stakeholders have driven this uh, national suicide prevention pro program will help preventing that people who attempt suicide will end up in prison but two years ago that was still happening uh, so there's still a lot of work to uh, be done <coughs> they have a very sophisticated approach to suicide prevention so in their program and it's it's interesting to look it up because they do refer to the more population based universal uh, strategies and particularly restricting access to means and the main way to achieve that is not only to collaborate or to link in with people in health but health and the agricultural department need to work uh, together and then they also have a range of selected and indicated interventions in recent times alcohol abuse domestic violence have increased also significantly so these are issues to address as well and again, uh, beyond my expectations, I think it was uh, early last year when I got a request from um, the Ministry of Public Health in uh, Kabul. Could we, could YASP help them to prepare a national suicide prevention strategy? And again, I was very surprised because there were so many other challenges in that country, and particularly the infrastructure for health and mental health was, you know, it's very unstable. And interestingly, uh, when you can't see the people, but this is a, a photo, uh, so they do send me minutes of their advisory panel meetings to build a national strategy. And you also see a representation, for example, of women. And these are women representing the Ministry of Women in Kabul, in Afghanistan. So, and I was delighted to see that development because self-immolation amongst women is, is very high in, uh, in Afghanistan. But it was a surprise. It was a very pleasant surprise to see that this is happening. They have asked IASP and WHO to work with them in terms of train the trainer programs to increase awareness and to adapt these programs to the cultural uh, context. However, due to safety reasons, we haven't been able to put this in place. Then as an alternative, we said, could we maybe invite people to come over for a train the trainer program and to do the training in Turkey? At the time when we had the arrangements made, Turkey became unsafe. So you see, and, and here what I would like to, we have to be innovative and also maybe uh, instigate more interventions and training via e-learning or uh, IT-based interventions, particularly when people are almost trapped and stuck in a country, but where the goodwill and the support is uh, growing. Another effort we made in ISP was to invite bursaries, bursary psychiatrists and psychologists to come to our international conference in Montreal last year because we had training programs and very unfortunately uh, they weren't able to obtain a visa. So, so we, we, you know, we're, sometimes people are, and then I think IT based support and information exchange could be very helpful. 
And then below, I'm not going too much into detail, but of course in Afghanistan, as you can expect, uh, criminalization is still uh, present. And that means that you have to be careful about the accuracy of suicide statistics because um, many cases may not be counted or may be uh, counted as a, as a different cause of death. But uh, the figures here come from the representatives of the advisory panel and you see a higher uh, number, so this covers uh, one year, but a higher number of women involved in self-immolation than men. And obviously that is internationally um, something certainly remarkable. Moving to Ireland, before I move into the evidence-based interventions, uh, maybe not so surprising for you here to see that, um, particularly with the overall suicide rate, during the time where, we, where it was clear that there was an economic uh, recession, we did see a significant increase in suicide in um, Ireland, and partic particularly due to the increase in men. So amongst men, there was a 15% increase of suicide in a three-year time period. A dip then, slight dip there in 2010, uh, and then a slight increase again in the following years. And we have to be careful by jumping up and down too much about 2014, because 2014 are the preliminary statistics from the CSO and they will be going up because the preliminary statistics are always an underestimate of the final uh, statistics. Another important point here is I, I'm convinced that during the recession we were dealing with a true increase because also the so-called almost rest category of open verdicts, undetermined deaths, also went up. So, and these are cases where uh, the coroner is not able, on the basis of the available evidence, to de de determine the suicide verdict eh, beyond any reasonable uh, doubt. Uh, but you see the consistency there. The other important piece of evidence in this regard, Ireland is very fortunate to have the National Self Harm Registry. During the time <coughs> when suicide went up by 15%, Amongst men, mainly, uh, male self-harm went up with 30%. And I'm working really a long time in this whole area. And never have I seen a 30% increase in self-harm in only a time space of three years. And a lot of these self-harm cases were also instigated by uh, alcohol and, unfortunately, also highly lethal methods. So overall, non-fatal self-harm is very much a challenge amongst women, but during the recession we did see this kind of additional new group uh, coming up. And even now, even though we, we, we are moving towards a stabilization amongst men, uh, the rate of self-harm is still 12% higher than uh, the uh, last year before the uh, recession. So, as many of you probably know, so last year the new, the second national strategy for suicide prevention, or to, to reduce suicide for 2015-2020 uh, was published by uh, the Taoiseach and it was great to get this uh, major uh, support. And um, myself and colleagues were very involved in, in, in writing and preparing uh, the strategy. And it is truly a strategy, I think, that can make a difference in terms of previous uh, strategies or previous action uh, plans. One big um, innovation here is uh, a cross-sectoral approach towards the implementation of suicide prevention activities. So the Department of Health is still the lead. But before the publication of the strategy, there was a sign-off between health and other government departments, so health and justice, health and education, health and social welfare. So there's a true commitment for collaborative partnerships and working in terms of the implementation. There's a stronger focus on accountability and also monitoring and evaluation because it's one thing to start a strategy, but if you don't monitor and evaluate the progress in between, you don't know five years down the line what really has been put in place and uh, what has been effectively implemented. There's more emphasis on uh, surveillance systems such as the uh, registry of self-harm and particularly to monitor, uh, like a thermometer, uh, changes over time and see are there any new risk groups appearing, uh, are there any new methods being used and particularly even going from the year 
2013 to 2014, we've seen a significant increase in self-harm in young boys in the age groups 10 to 14 and 15 to 19. We would never have known that if we wouldn't have the registry uh, behind us. So in terms of uh, core components of national suicide prevention uh, strategy, a lot of work <coughs> has gone in building this uh, global report. It took about two years of work with co colleagues internationally to determine the evidence base for these 11, we could say 10 effectively uh, actions or components that the WHO recommends as these components should be part of a comprehensive national suicide prevention uh, program. Now, uh, over, overall, if you look at all the components, I would say there's a level of average evidence, so maybe average evidence for all of the components because some components still have uh, there are still some concerns or there are, let's say, only studies from a number, small number of countries or uh, regions. And particularly in the area of stigma reduction, it's very hard to find controlled studies or uh, very advanced high quality studies. But, but overall, uh, it was uh, felt and, 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 and decided that there was sufficient evidence for these uh, components. So I will highlight a number of the key components and also then indicate what is the new evidence and also how useful or how important this is for Ireland. The first aspect of uh, surveillance, so I'm very pleased to say that um, ourselves in the NSRF, we worked very closely with WHO last year and this year to prepare the practice manual for establishing and maintaining surveillance systems for suicide attempts and self-harm. So this is, uh, here I'm referring to hospital-based self-harm, non-fatal. Non so, and WHO, with all the international review reviewers, decided that the template of the Irish National Self-Harm Registry provided uh, an excellent template to promote surveillance systems internationally. Now, in addition to the Irish Registry, um, there's also an important multi-centre study in the UK, which is exemplary, and <coughs> work on surveillance being done by the CDC, the Centres of Disease Control, was also taken into account. So, in that regard, we could say if we will look at all the components, Ireland has a certain lead in the world, and obviously we're doing very well. However, you always have to remain critical. In Ireland, we still don't know enough about what is the extent of non-fatal self-harm that comes to the door of the GP. We don't know. We don't even have regional surveillance or regional monitoring systems. So if you think of the iceberg, which I usually bring, except today, <laughs> uh, to the lectures, uh, then uh, the, the middle level of the iceberg is always uh, the, the hospital-based extent of self-harm. But we, below that, we have hidden cases of self-harm, even what we know on the basis of our school-based surveys, but also primary care referred to self-harm. So I think we can uh, certainly benefit from that and move on. And the earlier we are able to identify people at risk of self-harm, uh, the more beneficial the efforts can be in terms of intervention and prevention. Restricting access to means. Um, <clears throat> internationally, there is, we could almost say, amazingly consistent evidence of the effectiveness of restricting access to lethal methods. Uh, whether you look at pesticides or toxic medication or, for example, increasing the safety on bridges or, or, or spots or areas where people frequently go to. And my colleague Jane Pierk is in Australia also find very consistent evidence uh, that there was a significant reduction of suicide when uh, the safety of certain areas was uh, increased. Then, uh, a new phenomenon I think would be very important that that wouldn't be specified in the media, but uh, across the world we've seen a trend, a growing trend of use of helium gas, and unfortunately people get uh, access to that or access to that information very much also via internet and social media. Uh, so that would certainly be a challenge for us to look at <coughs> with uh, great uh, priority. So, so overall this is 
uh, an evidence-based intervention, uh, but it is recommended to implement this intervention with other uh, interventions as well, so providing uh, an appropriate crisis response or increasing awareness around self-harm and related uh, risk factors. So, uh, obviously, with the surveillance uh, systems that we have in Ireland, we are obviously well equipped to identify what are in Ireland uh, important methods where we should start restricting access, uh, access to means. And <coughs> interestingly, the self-harm registry is now in existence for 13 years, and at least during 10 of the 13 years, each year we see that benzodiazepines, so the minor tranquilizers, are the most frequently used method of non-fatal self-harm, and both for men and women. And quite often this is also then combined with other methods. So we already made the case to the Department of Health that we urgently need to set up a task force to start looking into ways of restricting access to benzodiazepines. We do know there's, there's certainly some evidence for over-prescribing of uh, benzodiazepines, but benzodiazepines can also be accessed on the street and can also be accessed via internet. So um, that is just an example where we can benefit from this, uh, this evidence and also this work. I think, yeah. No, I think I'm doing the wrong thing. So I probably... Training and education, um, compared to 10 years ago, we can now say that in terms of awareness and skills training, there's a lot of consistent evidence in terms of improving uh, levels of knowledge, changing attitudes, but also improving confidence amongst healthcare professionals or other gatekeepers, how to speak to people who may be suicidal, how to refer people who may be suicidal. And there's also growing evidence that um, we should refrain more and more from once-off training sessions, but we should start training uh, using a train-the-trainer approach and training GPs, psychologists to train their peers in the, in the future. Um, so that's obviously a very positive development. What we still don't know uh, in, in a very robust way is when in an area or a country you see that people are well trained and their knowledge and attitudes level, levels have improved, does it mean that we can expect a reduction in suicide or self-harm? So the link between intermediate and primary outcomes is still not very clear. So that's obviously something we have to look at here in Ireland as well. Again, in Connecting for Life, the new strategy, there are a number of uh, important key components to uh, put in place sustainable uh, training, uh, both for healthcare and community-based organizations. And I'm very pleased to show you um, very new, uh, new evidence, particularly the, the paper here on the left. Um, it hasn't even been included in Puppet, but it came out yesterday. So Ireland was part of a comparative European study where we um, assessed the effectiveness of training of police officers. So uh, Limerick was one of the sites where we trained nearly 600 police officers using the train the trainer uh, approach. Other countries involved were Germany and Portugal, and very interestingly, we saw very similar outcomes in terms of how this training contributed to improved knowledge, improved confidence, and change in attitudes. And a few years ago, we were also working with people in Europe and Ireland was involved to look at the effectiveness of gatekeeper awareness training amongst other health and community-based groups, so nurses, uh, teaching staff, social workers and, and similar consistent evidence was found. So I think it's very promising and based on this evidence we can clearly state that we can, we can expand this training uh, beyond Limerick and move to a national level. In terms of school-based intervention programs, for a long time there was very inconsistent and weak evidence as to what interventions work, uh, how can we increase the awareness of young people in terms of uh, mental health literacy and more awareness around mental health. But I'm also very pleased to say that my uh, colleague Paul Corcoran and, and Helen Keeley were involved in the so-called SAIL study, Saving and Young Lives, uh, sa Saving and Empowering Young Lives in Europe. And the outcome paper was published in The Lancet uh, last year with very good outcomes in terms of um, 
doing very uh, peer-oriented awareness training with uh, young people in terms of increasing their awareness on mental health literacy, but also taking the entry of teaching staff to increase uh, their uh, awareness. And um, at some level in this uh, international collaborative research, they were able to detect uh, a positive effect on reduced suicidal ideation and suicide attempts following this training. So in Ireland, Ireland was the collaborating in this international study, the work was done in Cork and Kerry. So I would say with that important evidence, under the umbrella of Connecting for Life, we can move to other counties as well. So we don't need to invent the wheel again anymore. This is robust evidence that says these specific types of interventions can be implemented in other counties in Ireland. Then uh, the more specific or indicated interventions, we have some very good news, I think, finally, after so many years. I was working with Keith Houghton in the 90s and we did a systematic review on interventions, similar as the update here. And then we, we only had very disappointing news. We couldn't find strong evidence for certain interventions. However, now more than 10 years later, uh, we identified a growing number of uh, RCTs, uh, evaluation studies, covering far over 17,000 uh, participants. And one of the key outcomes was the consistent positive and significant uh, effect of cognitive behavior therapy with its impact on reducing repeated self-harm and in some of the larger studies are also indications of reduced risk of uh, suicide. Um, another intervention which is worthwhile mentioning, the, the evidence is a bit less robust, but dialectical behavior, th it's, uh, de behavior therapy is a specific long-term treatment for people with chronic or frequent repeated self-harm and it's very much linked to borderline personality disorder but on the basis of the available studies there, there's reason for optimism in terms of um, it, its impact on reduced risk of uh, self-harm. So I was very pleased and obviously we were working closely with people in, in uh, the Department of Health to get this as a priority uh, on the radar. So in terms of evidence, uh, we can really say that DBT and CBT are evidence-based interventions. But how do we get this implemented in accordance with required capacity in all regions in Ireland? So I would say that is obviously an important uh, priority and challenge under the umbrella of Connecting for Life. And then one of the last important uh, areas of suicide prevention, uh, this refers to work that's being done for 13 years now in the European Alliance Against Depression and also in Japan some of this work has been done. And so there's growing evidence that within a region if you implement multiple interventions at the same time that the benefit or, the, uh, or the, the added value is much higher than implementing one intervention after the other over uh, many years. And the particular interventions here include uh, sustainable training for primary care professionals, particularly in improving awareness and skills training, a positive mental health oriented uh, anti-stigma campaign and also facilitating help-seeking behaviour but all at the same time, and then obviously a wide range of uh, sustainable training for community uh, facilitators. And in recent years, we also added in the whole menu uh, the restricting access to means uh, interventions. So uh, in Japan, in Germany, in Hungary, similar effects have been identified in terms of its impact on reducing suicide and attempted uh, suicide. The media, last but not uh, least, um, there is consistent evidence internationally that if there is ongoing detailed and sensationalized media reporting that there is a link with uh, repeated or multiple cases of suicide or even uh, attempted suicide. Um, it's harder to find evidence for the other way around. If you find evidence for uh, more long-term appropriate reporting, do we then see a reduction of suicide or attempted suicide? Well, that evidence is not uh, very uh, consistent. However, first studies have, have shown, particularly a very sophisticated study in uh, Austria, 
But it is overall very clearly indicated that in times of, for example, an emerging suicide cluster or a murder-suicide case, where even recently we saw a very extreme uh, example, that in order to not, or in order to avoid contagion or copycat, not amongst the general public, but amongst those individuals who are currently in a similar trapped <coughs> challenging situation. So if they see this as a way out, yes, this could put them over the threshold. And it's one thing then to put out the whole story, but we do have evidence that if there's a lot of emphasis on the specific methods, it's very likely that in the next case the same method will be used. And we have very strong international evidence on that. So many years ago, Samaritans, together with National Office for Suicide Prevention, they already put in place uh, the media guidelines. They have been launched and relaunched, and the press ombudsman in Ireland is taking them into account. But I think we still have to move further to really enforcing and implementing uh, the media guidelines in a sustainable way. And I think that the, the headlines here eh, of the very ex tragic and extreme case of murder suicide, uh, all these headlines here completely counteract what we indicate in the media uh, guidelines. And particularly the details on how, uh, how the deaths occurred and, 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 and the specific details on the uh, method. The other thing that struck me when the news came out was um, in the first two days the family was painted as the almost a fairy tale family. Everything was fine, uh, everything seemed to be perfect, it was the perfect family. So how could this have happened from one moment to the other? Um, the second part of the week uh, the, the, the man involved was painted as a killer, uh, a butcher, and, and there were all kinds of speculations as to domestic violence or other uh, issues. So it is, again, the general public can put it in, in an equation, or people who are resilient and strong, but for people who are vulnerable, they are lost in confusion, or they may consider seeing this as a way out. So I really think that looking at this happening uh, this month, we, we still have a long way to go with the media guidelines. So I'm coming closer to uh, an end. So despite the fact that in Ireland we are a little bit careful in terms of putting out a very specific target to where would we like to be in 2020 in terms of reducing suicide and, uh, and self-harm, obviously the aim is to reduce, but at the same time looking at the international evidence, there's still scope for improvement also at the surveillance uh, level. That means we can't only look in 2020 at, okay, what has changed in the suicide rates? What has changed in the self-harm rates? We also have to look at how many people have been trained? How many people are implementing the training? Have we changed the policy of prescribing benzodiazepines? Are there more appropriate articles in the media about suicide clusters or cases of murder suicide. So we can look at, we should look at those intermediate outcomes as well. Yeah, and on this note, I, which is uh, on the one hand an optimistic note, but there's also a sad element to it, so I would like to end here. I'm referring here to two biographies of two major Dutch writers, and it's coincidence that it's Dutch, it's trained in, in the Netherlands, and sometimes I keep an eye obviously what's happening there. But um, the first time I came across this statement was when um, the first writer, when he died by suicide, and not long before his death, he published a biography in which he described the many occasions when he was admitted to, to hospital for uh, an overdose for attempted suicide. And at the end of the biography, he indicates that on none of these 50 or more occasions that he was referred, he really wanted to die. What he wanted was a different life. And some of you may think, well, what's the difference? I think there's a fundamental difference. And particularly, there's a fundamental difference if you as a nurse are in the emergency department and you see somebody coming to just want to die, it was an unsuccessful suicide and all these terms I still hear. No, there's a lot of, uh, there's much more behind it and there is a wish to life. Now then, 
very interestingly, the most well-known um, writer in the Netherlands until last year, Joost Zwagerman, a lot of his books have been translated in all languages in, in, in the world, he very much uh, started advocacy in the media uh, to, to support people bereaved by suicide and to indicate uh, awareness. And he repeated this statement. And against all expectations, <coughs> last year in the week of World Suicide Prevention Day, he also took his life. So, so despite our progress, despite the evidence, I think we should strongly hold on on this statement and bring it back to uh, small-scale interventions, to, uh, to all the interventions also that are happening maybe in, in, in media campaigns, because even the people who, who expose some openness, uh, maybe we still need to be, uh, maybe, I know we have to be more proactive to link in and to engage. And on that note, I think, I don't have it here anymore, no, but we could, no, I don't go back to the, sorry, but um, this was also one of the thinkings behind the theme eh, of uh, World Suicide Prevention Day this year. So connect, communicate, uh, care. And people want to be connected, people want to be communicated with, and people want to be cared. So thank you very much. Yeah, um, we, we don't really have national data or national uh, studies, but <laughs> very interestingly, when I was starting my PhD, I, I was asked to start with GP practice monitoring, <laughs> and this was in the Leiden uh, area. And after that study, some similar studies have been done in the UK and in some Scandinavian countries. And what, on average, we can say is that around 25% percent of uh, people who engage in, uh, in, in self-harm are almost immediately referred further on to the emergency department or there's a facilitation by the GP. Around 15 percent, uh, it's, it's an average of people who engage in self-harm, they remain with the GP. So here you can think obviously of the lower lethality acts of uh, intentional overdose or self-cutting, so where the GP certainly can manage the medical treatment. However, what we see from even the request that we get through ICGP, that the need for um, advancement and, and upscaling, upskilling in the mental health area is very important as well. Because in the emergency department, a person is being referred to the psych department or the psych liaison service for an assessment, or nowadays we have self-harm assessment nurses in the ED. Um, but with, with in, in primary care, this can still vary, and we, we know it can vary depending on where you are being referred to. With one very optimistic note, again supported by the National Office for Suicide Prevention, um, there is a, a growing implementation of the so-called SCAN uh, nurses, um, as nurses working specifically with a number of GPs in a region. So when a GP gets a referral from somebody who has suicidal thoughts or suicidal plan or a lowly lethal uh, act, uh, then the self-harm nurse can be accessed immediately on the same day for, a, a assess, for an assessment. So I certainly think that's an improvement. But the GP is only a very important gatekeeper. I still would value very strongly training and upskilling of a GP because if a person feels that they can't talk about the suicidal thoughts, they may never get the referral to the scan nurse eh? because that, that could be done an obstacle uh, before that referral. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot for the excellent presentation. I think a long time to try to have something from a global perspective and you kind of brilliantly touched on the global issue of mental health and suicide in particular and yeah. bringing now to, to ICE mm -hmm. context which would be uh, very interesting for our students, potential students to, to take on some mm -hmm. projects in this area. 
And uh, I'd like to congratulate again on the, on the, on the, the team you have uh, for the ones you said you mentioned, this kind of complicated care. And communication, I think, is the key because mm -hmm. there's evidence suggesting that better communication leads to better health. And yeah. Yeah. you did touch on the mental health literacy angle. Exactly, and yeah. Uh, just a quick query, like, do you have any evidence suggesting that uh, increased or adequate mental health literacy has improved the, some of the outcomes because we have seen the context of yeah. other chronic conditions that yeah. have improved but in society. Yeah, a number of important examples, and thank you, Subir, for that. With the colleagues in the European Alliance Against uh, Depression, so I think it's about 18 countries in Europe, and we started in uh, South America, and obviously there was implementation in, in Japan. What we have seen from a positive mental health awareness campaign, but reinforced by GPs, by community facilitators, that we have had a number of independent before and after evaluations, not controlled. Uh, well, in one study it was controlled. But what we have seen is uh, following those campaigns, uh, which were done very massively and repeatedly over at least a time space of six months, uh, we've seen an increase obviously in, in knowledge of people in terms of uh, identifying symptoms of depression and suicidal behavior, but also a more positive response to help seeking behavior. Or also where questions are, if you would be in this type of situation, would you pick up the phone or arrange a session with your GP or a, a psychologist? So the, overall, the before and after outcomes were very uh, supportive. Going back to a specific risk group, and this is, uh, this is kind of not an anecdote, but, but uh, very important. We've been putting so much work over the years in working more closely with the coroners, not only to obtain more detailed information on consecutive cases of suicide, but also to proactively facilitate support for bereaved family members. And I started with the work in this region. Uh, we, well, we had funding, let's say, at the start of the recession, and then funding faded out. And <coughs> so it's almost a naturalistic study. So in the first two years, when the highly trained clinical psychologist facilitated proactively the request for support for bereaved family members, the uptake was 85%. Then the funding was cut, and the only thing we could do is send a sympathetic, supportive letter and say, we are here, you can ring us when you have a question. The uh, response went down from 85% to 6%. So proactive communication and openness, where, where sometimes we may think, oh, after an inquest, oh, we should leave the family alone, we, we're not going to. They want contact, they want to be spoken to, they won't, don't want to be ignored. And also even going through the experience of an inquest in a courtroom, Nobody has undertaken a criminal act, but yet they have to be there. So, so even even sharing their experiences immediately after the inquest was very supportive and facilitated. So we were only building a bridge between the family and the next appropriate uh, care. So, so again, it's it's communication, but it's also connecting in a, in a proactive uh, way. Yeah. Okay. Uh, does anybody yeah. have any more questions before we finish? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.